Well, good day. I thought I'd take you for a ride today since, as I said last week, I'm kind of running out of backdrops since we're not traveling yet. Uh, but this is February 4th. This is going to be the video for the Chronological Bible series uh, to accompany the blog post that will go out tomorrow, February 5th, 2018. So thanks for joining us. I'm talking about today, the readings this week came out of Job. We finished Job. I talked about it last week, but I had a few chapters to read this week, so Job 38 through 42. Um, but I've already talked about those, so I'm going to talk about the rest of the readings this week. So I'm going to talk in this video about the rest of the readings that came out of Exodus 1 through 12 today. So in the story of Exodus, if you have ever read that, if you've ever seen the old 1950s, I think 1956, Cecil B. DeMille movie, The Ten Commandments, starring Charlton Heston, um, you probably have a good idea of what the story in Exodus is all about. That movie, it's, it's not a bad movie, and it, it does a pretty good job of, of following the storyline. So if you haven't seen that, I encourage you to go look that up up and, and watch it sometime. Um, but the story of Exodus comes right on the tail of Genesis. So if you recall, Genesis finished with uh, telling the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then finished up with the details about Jacob's children, uh, the twelve, his 12 sons. And we talked about how Joseph had gone to Egypt and, and without going through all the details, was uh, put eventually in control of all of Egypt and ultimately brought his whole family to Egypt to live during a time of famine. Well, all of those family members then stayed there and uh, were living in the land of Goshen and Joseph died and so that's where Exodus picks up. We, we know that Joseph died at the end of Genesis and then Exodus tells us about uh, a new king in Egypt that didn't know Joseph. And just to set the stage for that, you need to realize that we're talking probably 350 years have passed. So it's not like the next king. It's several pharaohs or kings down the line. But uh, by this time, the Israelites have grown into an entire nation where they started out with just 70 uh, male family members plus their wives and children. Um, they have now grown into a nation of you know, millions or at least over a million people. So that's where the, the story picks up in the book of Exodus. And so we read about how this king became fearful of the growing number of Israelites. So he decided that he was going to put them into slavery in order to keep control of them. And uh, they continued to prosper. And so he issued the order that all of the, the male children were to be killed um, whenever they were born. And so um, there was one family that in particular that we read about in Exodus who when their baby boy was born, they ended up hiding this baby boy and putting him in a bag basket uh, that they sealed up with pitch and they put in the Nile uh, River so that he could float and, and hopefully be spared from uh, from being killed. And as it turns out, um, this baby boy was found by the daughter of Pharaoh. And so she recognized immediately that this was one of the Israelite children and uh, decided that she would adopt him and raise him as her own. And so she raised this boy. She named him Moses and raised him in the house of Pharaoh. And so we don't get any, any more detail than that, and but we do find out that then when Moses was 40 years old, he had kept uh, note of his heritage, and so he knew that he was uh, uh, still a Hebrew, and he saw some Egyptians mistreating some Hebrews, and so he ended up uh, killing 
an Egyptian there, and that became known. And so Moses, when he was 40, ended up having to flee the land of Egypt uh, and go into exile in, for fear of his life. And so, again, a very uh, small amount of information is given to us, but he is out of the desert. He lives there. He marries, uh, has children, and another 40 years passes. So now Moses is 80 years old when the story picks up. And the story tells us about how Moses then was called by God. He, in, he encountered a burning bush out in the desert uh, on the mountainside. And he saw that that bush was not, it was burning, but it wasn't being consumed. And so Moses went over to the bush and, and God spoke to him from the book, uh, from the bush. And uh, introduced himself to Moses as the God of uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so, again, without going through all of the details there, God ends up calling Moses to go back to Egypt and confront the king, confront Pharaoh, who, by the way, is now a even a different king from the one who had ordered the deaths of the children. Uh, God tells Moses, the one that had wanted you dead is no longer alive anymore. And so Moses goes on back to Egypt and he confronts Pharaoh and God has told Moses that I want you to uh, pr to do these these miracles, these signs um, for the king whenever the king, when you first approach him and ask him to let the people go, he will of course refuse. And so Moses endis, ends up um, uh, being told by God to go and, and do these particular signs and miracles. And God tells him, uh, and you can read the blog to get more more detail on this, but God tells him that when he has done all of those signs, both, uh, the king is still not going to let the people go, and so you will tell him that Israel is my firstborn, and that uh, because he won't let them go, I will take his firstborn, um, and I will kill him. And so that, that's how the story kind of lays out. So Moses does that, he goes and he confronts the king and you get all these plagues and miracles that God performs uh, for the Israelites and there, or for the Egyptians. And one kind of interesting thing is if you go through and read the text there, especially in chapters 9 and 10, is where the, the plague details are worked out. And again, you can read this in the blog post. But the, what's interesting is after the first couple of plagues, um, God starts making distinctions between the Egyptians and the Israelites. And he says, I'm going to do these things, the, the darkness, the hail, the locusts, that kind of thing, on the property and the people of the Egyptians, but the property and people of the Israelites are going to be spared. And so God begins to make this distinction. And so then he goes through, and then the last thing that we read about in chapter 12 is where God declares that he's going to um, to kill the firstborn. And so he instructs the Israelites to go through a very specific set of, uh, uh, of tasks uh, in, that eventually became Passover. This is where God actually initiated the Passover celebration and he told the Israelites that they need to go through and find a an unblemished male lamb uh, from the sheep or the goats uh, that was one year old and that they were at, at, at on a certain day in preparation for this uh, the time when the angel of death was going to come through and kill the Egyptian children God told the Israelites that to be spared they needed to slaughter this Passover lamb and then spread its blood over the uh, the door frame uh, as a signal uh, signifying how they have been trusting God they have been set apart and they are believing in him that he is not going to bring destruction on their household and so some other things about the Passover lamb uh, it has to be roasted it has to be uh, all entirely consumed um, it has to be um, the bones cannot be broken uh, and all of that. Again, you can read the details uh, there in my blog post. But 
So I just want to make a, a few comments on three things about this story here. And the first is just simply whenever God revealed to Moses uh, what he was going to do, even back when he was first calling Moses out of that burning bush, he was very specific about the fact that he was going to do a number of different signs culminating in the death of the firstborn children. So, And God tells Moses that I'm going to do this uh, in order to bring glory to to myself both in the eyes of the Egyptians so they would know who God is but also in the eyes of the Israelites so that as uh, in generations to come that as you tell your children about this that they will understand who their God really is so God was very specific this was the plagues were not um, a spur of the moment vengefulness of a, of a God that was seeking revenge on something or other this was planned out specifically for the judgment of the Egyptians and also for the revealing of his glory and his plans. And then there's two really, really pretty significant pictures in this story about that connects to the gospel of Jesus. The first one is just about the Exodus itself, which the story doesn't end here. It actually plays out over quite a bit of the the middle part of the Old Testament. Um, but the story of the Exodus is all about how God um, recognizes the, the state, the, the slavery that his people are in. He chooses to send a prophet, in the case of Moses, to serve, to deliver those people, to confront their captors, in this case, Pharaoh. And so he sends this prophet. The prophet then goes and performs the signs that God has given him. And then ultimately the prophet works out the judgment of God on the, the, the people of Egypt here and ends up leading the Israelites out. And so then as he goes and leads the Israelites out, he doesn't take them immediately to the promised land. There's some time, and again, we're going to deal with all this later, but he goes and takes them and they wander in the desert, but there is that continual looking forward to the promised land that God is, is ultimately taking them to. And this is just a, a glorious picture of exactly what Jesus did in out in really in the exodus that Jesus initiated that Jesus came he was the prophet sent by God he was God's son he came to confront Satan who is the one who enslaves us and keeps us in his control Jesus came and ultimately defeated him uh, by dying on the cross cross and then defeating death and coming uh, back from the grave and so in that same sense Jesus did in a much better and more eternal way what Moses did for the children of Israel. Jesus, just as he overcame death, we are still left here uh, once we follow him and we obey him and become Jesus' followers. We're still left here wandering, if you will, in the desert, but looking forward to that promised land of heaven that God has given us. So there's that picture in Exodus. And then you also have the picture of the sacrificial uh, Passover lamb. And, and the whole idea of Passover, that Jesus, in essence, created a new Passover of the angel of death, gave us the chance to, um, to allow death to pass us over and us to be able to conquer that. And so uh, we see that Jesus was a male, that he was the firstborn, that he was um, the uh, unblemished, he was without sin, just as the Passover lamb was. When he was crucified, he was crucified and his, his bones were not broken and he was entirely consumed, meaning that he died and, and he was buried. And yet uh, Jesus, uh, just as the Passover lamb's blood ended up covering the doorposts and the, the door frame of the Israelites. So Jesus' blood covers up us as a sign of the Passover victory that God has enabled us to encounter. So uh, just a, again, another really neat um, picture of the gospel there. 
So that's it for this week's readings from Exodus. Next week we'll be looking at uh, kind of the middle part of Exodus, chapter 13. I don't remember how far it goes, chapter to 28 or something like that. So I'll be going over that next week. So uh, if you've been, I appreciate you watching and uh, the area that I've been driving around here in eastern Colorado is just to give you a few things of different scenery to look at. Uh, we'll be doing, I don't know what, next week, whenever I go through next week's reading. But thanks for joining us. Like and subscribe if you're able to, and I'll see you next week.